Uh, it's lovely to be with you, and thank you for this kind invitation. Where's Pastor Martin gone? I can't see him. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Please pass on my regards to Pastor Steve. Yeah. And uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity just to share with you on Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. I'm just going to try in this time just to give you a sense of the greatness of God in terms of the creation of the universe. And I just need to remind you that in Genesis 1, sometimes people have real problems with Genesis 1. I don't know why in some ways, because it's very straightforward the way it's written. I know it raises issues, but uh, it is simply saying that on each of these days, God made a wonderful part of his creation. And you well know that on day four, it actually tells you that the sun, moon, and stars were made, which means immediately people raise an issue because what happens about the lights on days one to three? Let me just try and help you a bit because the Bible is very straightforward, even though it may raise issues in our minds. It is straightforward because it's using the word yom with a number, and it's using the word yom in the Hebrew with evening and morning. And rather than raising complications and coming from those complications to the scripture, just stick to the, what the scriptures say is my position. And the scriptures make it abundantly plain. Everywhere there is an instance of evening and morning and the word day, it means a straightforward 24-hour day. Everywhere where you get the word yom used with a number, it means an ordinary day. Genesis is historical literature. Poetry always has repetition, which you do sometimes get the Psalms referring to creation. Psalm 33, you can look at it later, is an instance. But the word yom is a 24-hour day here for the reasons that I've just mentioned to you, that is the evening and morning issue and the repetition. A classic example, by the way, of evening and morning is when uh, you actually get, uh, uh, in 1 Samuel 17, David fighting or about to fight Goliath, and it says that Goliath appeared in that case morning and evening for 40 days. Well, it obviously doesn't mean 40 years. It doesn't mean 40 weeks. It doesn't mean 40 million years. It means 40 ordinary days. So do you get the point that wherever you get evening or morning or both with the word yom, it always means a 24-hour day? Perhaps one of the scriptures which makes it abundantly plain is Exodus 20, verse 11, where Certainly for the Jews at that time, they were being given the Sabbath, which for them was the Saturday. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea that, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. It actually specifically mentions the heavens. So we have to keep to what the scriptures say. There's no way that God is not talking about the ordinary week in Exodus 20, verse 11. So what do you do with this issue of the fourth day and the three days beforehand? What it, the objection is, how can you have a day and night made before the sun? Well, Matthew 17 makes it abundantly plain that Jesus Christ shone with light which was from himself. Now, that doesn't mean that I immediately can say that in Genesis 1, the light was God's own Shekinah glory, but it does raise that possibility that it might be that. And certainly in Revelation 21, when it comes to the new heavens, we're told expressly that the sun is not needed in that place because the lamb is the light of that place. I'm just using scripture. I'm not coming from the complications to the scripture. That's not the way to approach this. You come from the scripture, if you're a believer, to those other issues, which, of course, it raises. Uh, it may be that it's the light of God. I'm not saying dogmatically that it is that, 
because it doesn't say. It could just be that God made a local light source and a rotating globe. But for those first three days, we must simply say that God knows more than we do. And that is the position we should have. And then obviously on the fourth day, everything was essentially put as it is now, although there were no doubt changes as God, I think, actually shook everything when man fell. But I won't try and go into that detail now. Let me just play you this, which perhaps sets the scene a bit. We've come a long way since the, t- the days of 1968, which I can remember. Most of you probably can't. But I remember this occasion when, from space, NASA scientists, NASA astronauts, I should say, read Genesis 1. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Just to sort of really underline this point, James Irwin, who's now died, but he was one of the early uh, astronauts, he said quite rightly that God walking on the earth is more important than man walking on the moon. I think we've degenerated a long way since those glorious days, which I do remember, and the first man walking on the moon was just wonderful, you know, sort of seeing it on this fuzzy screen as, uh, uh, as the you know, the the first steps were made on the moon. Here is such such a sad contrast. Stephen Hawking, who himself has now died, said this, the human race is just a chemical scum on a moderate sized planet orbiting around an average star in the outer suburb of 100 billion galaxies. We're so insignificant that I can't believe the whole universe exists for our benefit. How sad. You see, when you have a right view of Scripture and let Scripture speak to you, as those early astronauts were prepared to do, it changes everything. You see, God made on day one light. On the day two, he made the expanse, sometimes called the firmament, which is not a very good English translation because it gives the idea of a dome. But the original Hebrew word is the expanse. And then on day three, he made the flowers and the trees. Day four, he made the sun, moon, and stars, which we've just mentioned to you. The fish and the flying creatures on day five, and the animals and man, finally, on day six. We've already shown that those days should be regarded as ordinary days. Now, the stars and the heavenly bodies were made on the fourth day of the creation week, Psalm 19 that we read declares that the heavens are declaring, rather, the glory of God. Psalm 8 declares that the stars are the work of his fingers. Contrast this with Isaiah 59, which says that when it comes to bringing salvation, God bears his arm. You see... You think that the stars is a big problem, not to God. It's just the work of his fingers. In a moment, I'm going to tell you how many there are. You'll be here a long time if we all count them. You'll see in a moment. But all these stars were made just by the work of his fingers. And yet when it comes to the Lord's great work of salvation, he bears his arm. Always remember that. Though I'm speaking on creation and the creation of the stars at this service, actually everything is pointing to the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. When you turn to Colossians, uh, which uh, I'm not going to ask you to turn to, but I'll just quote, quote it so that you get the context. You see that it says in verse 16, by him were all things created that are in heaven, that includes the stars, that are in earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. And then it goes on to say that he is before all things and by him all things consist. And then it says that he will 
he is preeminent in all things in verse 18. And then it speaks of redemption, having made peace through the blood of his cross, verse 20. By, and then it says, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By this, by him I say, whether they be things in earth, all things in heaven. Which is why I think that there was a real shaking of the universe when man fell. You see, friends, we need to get a big view of God, but in particular, the second person of the Trinity, you need to have a big view of. Yes, he became man. We're going to be thinking of that at, at Bethlehem. But the greatness of Christ in sustaining all things by the word of his power, Hebrews 1 verse 3, must be in your mind as you consider the universe. In my, in my projection of what I'm seeking to say now, let me just, just briefly take you to the cross. When Jesus Christ bled and died on the cross, do you realize that he was sustaining the whole of the universe? by the word of his power, even as he died on that cross. That's the greatness of Christ in particular. Now, of course, it's the greatness of the Father, the greatness of the Holy Spirit as well. We don't separate the Trinity. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Now we come to back to the stars particularly. Each star is named in Psalm 147 verse 4. It says he knows all the stars by name. Should we, check, should we just work out how, how many stars there are? Might just uh, uh, help you to see the greatness of what the Lord is doing. When it says that he knows all the stars by name. Well, visible stars, probably around 3,000 in both hemispheres. A six-inch reflector telescope, maybe 30,000. A large professional telescope, estimates have been made and this is probably somewhere around the right number, that it's 2 times 10 raised to the 11th power, which is 200,000 million. Count, this is just one galaxy. Counting three stars per second after 100 years, you would have counted less than 5% of the Milky Way galaxy alone, which is, I haven't, uh, shown you the picture of this, but it's 100,000 light years across. That means that light takes 100,000 years at its present speed to cross the whole galaxy. The Milky Way is gigantic. Light, which travels at the enormous speed of almost 100 million miles per second, actually takes 100,000 years to cross our galaxy. That's just incredible. That's just one galaxy. Counting three million stars per second, it would take 18 and a half hours to count all of the 200 billion, 200,000 million Milky Way stars, right? But that's just one galaxy. The Milky Way is one of billions of galaxies. Well, how many are there? Well, let me just give you a sense of proportions here. If you take the whole... Hubble Ultra Deep Field Telescope, in an image which is just one-tenth of the angular diameter of the moon, right, which to give it, pers to, to help you to actually sort of see what this might be like, it's like taking a bit of paper with a one millimeter hole in it, square hole, right, and just holding it a meter away from you, right, this is what you would see with the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Telescope. So what I'm going to show you is what that telescope, which is a very big telescope, it's no longer actually being used, it's replaced by the James Webb Telescope, which is now being put into space. But just to give you a sense, if I made a hole in here, right, which is just one millimetre by one millimetre and held about one meter away from me, this is what you would see, right? Oh, it won't move on. <laughs> yeah, it's because I've got, yeah, right. You, that's what you would see. So now do you get a sense of scale as to how many galaxies there are? I just told you how many stars there are in the Milky Way, but now we're asking how many galaxies are there? 
And this picture really blew the minds of most people when they saw it. This was some years ago. Because you could see many, many, many galaxies in that picture. So that was just one tiny pinprick in the whole of the possibilities, looking all the way around space. And so some estimates about the universe are as follows. Over two million galaxies have actually been counted, but it's estimated that there could be as many as 100,000 million galaxies. Now, I know it's Sunday afternoon, and I know you've had your lunch, but you've got to do a calculation with me, because now you've got to multiply 10 to the 11 times 2 by... 10 to the 11 again, and it, many people think that this is an underestimate, right? But we'll just take this underestimate to make the point, because it's obviously going to be more if it's more than this. You actually get, you, you got there very quickly, some of you engineers here, and maybe some of you cheated and got out the calculator. It's actually 2 times 10 raised to the power 22. This is getting a bit large. Some say that it might be even as large as 10 raised to the power of 24. But if you want to actually see this number written out, it's 20 with all those zeros after it. Let's now do the same sort of estimate with a computer. If a computer were observing 3 million per second, it would take 211 million years to count all the stars. Remember the Lord knows all the stars by name. All right? So this is showing the greatness of the mind of Christ in particular because he sustains every single star which he knows by name. This is the second person of the Trinity. Everyone is supported, it says, Hebrews 11 verse 3, by the word of his power. At 10 million per second, which is pretty fast, it would take 63 million years to count them all. So you're dealing here with a very, very great God. Yes, it's a great universe, but it's a great God. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And that's what we're spelling out by looking at the number of the stars. Now, I've already said to you that the stars were made on day four. They declare the glory of God. The stars are the work of his fingers. But consider again what I've just said, that each star is named. And also, just remember what it says, if I was to have read it. I didn't actually read the whole of Genesis 1. But it does say in verse 16 of Genesis 1, that God made two great lights, which is the sun and the moon, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And then perhaps one of the greatest understatements of the whole Bible, he says, he made the stars also. <laughs> All 10 raised to the power 22. And I haven't told you about how big Space is, but it's reckoned to be of the order of 20 billion light years across. Not 20 million, not hundreds of thousands, but 20 billion light years across. However, it is finite. It is not infinite. And that's a very important point. The universe, even from what's been observed so far, seems to be connected with, sometimes they talk about great walls of galaxies, which all seem to be connected with one another. Each galaxy of the order of 100,000, 200,000 light years across seems to be connected with many other galaxies. And people are asking the question from the Big Bang idea, which I don't accept, but taking their own model, which is the Big Bang, they cannot conceive how on earth there has been enough time, even in their billions of years that they propose, for the electromagnetic radiation to cross from one galaxy to another, let alone to cross all the way right across the whole universe. 
There are huge problems that people never talk about in the Big Bang model. Now, let me just, though, keep to what the scriptures say. Considering day two and day four, which I showed you in my early diagram, according to the scriptures, it says that God made the expanse on day, four, day two. Let there be an expanse, verse six of Genesis one, if you've got it there. In the midst of the waters, let the expanse divide the waters from the waters. Now, just taking the scriptures up exactly the face value, this means that God made space. Now, why do I consider it to be space? Because it goes on in verse 7 to say God made the expanse, which the actual Hebrew word is the rachia, okay? And divided the waters which were under the rachia, I'll keep using the word rachia because firmament, which is the old King James translation, is not a good translation here because it gives the idea of a dome. So it's a much better sense of what rachia means is to say simply expanse, which we might call space or space time even it might be possible here. But anyway, the, the expanse from the waters which were above from the waters which were below. And it was so. God called, verse 8, let me just read verse 7 back part again. God made the expanse, divided the waters which were under the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. Then verse 8, God called the expanse what? Heaven. God called space, if my proposal is correct. He called it heaven. The actual word is Shemayim. So he called the Rachia, the Shemayim, according to verse 8. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So it was a very busy day on day two for God. You say, well, what was he busy doing? Some people, of course, say that it's the sky, but I'm going to show you that there's every reason to believe that it's not just the sky. It's actually space itself. Because, let me just divert two ticks, because space, people don't quite know what it is. People have suggested that there seems to be uh, some sort of energy still in space. People talk about zero-point energy. Nobody's quite sure. The first person to suggest that there was something there which is yet to be really understood, was actually none other than James Clark Maxwell. People have for a long while talked about ether, and that's gone out of fashion, quite understandably, because we don't believe in geocentric ideas. But nevertheless, space is suggested here in the Bible to be an entity, quite what it is, it's difficult to say, but even the physics of modern science is actually beginning to relook at the idea that space somehow is an entity, right? I'll just leave it there because there's an awful lot of things that I'm just top covering the top of the icebergs of. There's a huge amount underneath. Verse 9 then goes on to speak about the waters under the heaven being gathered unto one place. That's clearly the seas. So you might be well asking, well, what on earth is the waters above? I'll come back to that. We come now to the fourth day. And God says in verse 14 on the fourth day, let there be lights in the expanse of the heaven, the rachir of the Shemaim, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for, for years and uh, signs for, for seasons and for days and years. And let there be for lights in the rachia of the Shemayim to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. So he is saying, let them be for lights in the rachia of the Shemayim. And it's that verse, verse 15, which shows to me at a straightforward reading of Genesis 1 
that the rachia has to be space, because that's, of course, where the sun, moon, and the stars are. So God, just in summary, made these matters which we can't quite firmly grasp because none of us quite know even enough science and even the scientists are still struggling to work out what space is. But scripture seems to be clear that he made the Shemayim and sometimes called the Rachir, sometimes it's the, the, the Rachir of the Shemayim to give to give a place for the stars to be in. And this is really quite remarkable because now I'm going to speak to you just about something which follows from this in the scripture. Now, I know there are many people who will disagree with me strongly, but if you just take the scriptures at face value, there is something really remarkable which now begins to come out of this. If you follow me, you will find that in other scriptures in the Old Testament, not just once, not just twice, but not just three, four, five, but it's actually a total of 11 times, God speaks about stretching the heavens. And I find this fascinating. Isaiah 42, verse 5. Thus says God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out. And this tends to underline that the Shemayim, the Rachia, is indeed space. You've heard of people refer to the fact that there is a cosmological redshift. Wherever you look, there appears to be a predominance of stars, primarily galaxies, moving away from each other. There are one or two galaxies like Andromeda, which, relatively speaking, is not that far away from us, still a good number of <laughs> hundreds of thousands of light years away, but nevertheless, it's, it's relatively close, which has a slight blue shift. But most of the galaxies are actually moving away from us. And it does seem to bear out what the Lord has actually said in his word, that he stretched out them out there. Isaiah 45, verse 12. I've made the earth, created man upon it, even my hands, and have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. God stretching the heavens is possibly the initial expansion of space itself. Isaiah 40, verse 22. The one that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 12. He that hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 15. Job 9, verse 8. Psalm 104, verse 2. Isaiah 44, 24, Zechariah 12, verse 1. And so it goes on. God stretched out the heavens. Now you think, well, Andy, surely, are you really saying that God stretched out the heavens? Well, let me just now really ram it home. Isaiah 34, verse 4, uses a slightly different metaphor. Because now it's talking about judgment and how fascinating that the Lord when he talks about a reference in Isaiah as you well know the book of Isaiah looks at mountain peaks and sometimes he'll refer to the first coming sometimes he'll refer to the second coming of Christ and Isaiah is full of an incredible visions right forward in time and Isaiah 4, 34 verse 4 says, All the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their host shall fall down as the leaf falleth from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. God is surely here referring to the same event 
as Psalm 102 also refers to. Let me just give it to you because Psalm 102 verse 26 is actually quoted in the New Testament. So you're going to see here that the Lord appears to be using, maybe you would say it's a metaphor, but it could actually be literal the number of times that it says it. Uh, Psalm 102, verse 25. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish. We're dealing with the end of the universe. But thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. If I take off my coat... God's going to wrap up the universe like a coat, he says. If you don't think that that's true, turn with me to Matthew 24, verse 29, where the Lord actually refers himself to what's going to happen at the end. Matthew 24, verse 29. It's an incredible uh, discourse, the Olivet Discourse, where he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give a light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 12, which is again talking about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole theme of the book of Hebrews is the greatness of Christ that there is no one greater than him. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses and so on. It goes all the way through. And the, the book of Hebrews is just a fantastically wonderful book. And you'll find that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 12, it quotes Psalm 102. It begins in verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall wax old as doth the garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Conclusion. The Lord's going to pull the universe down. And how long is he going to take to do it? Millions of years? No way. You'll just pull it down like, a, like you pull down a curtain, like you fold up a garment, whatever metaphor you use. Now, friends, the reason I particularly stress how the Lord is going to deal with the end is that when you shine that back on the beginning, it begins to make you realise that God is far greater than you've imagined him to be. And as Luther once said, let the Holy Spirit, defer to the Holy Spirit to let you teach, let him teach you, and not the other way around. He said it in a different way in his rather clever manner in which he used to speak in his German, obviously. But, you know, grant that the Lord knows more than you was basically what Luther was saying. And we ought to have that same attitude when it comes to the beginning of creation. So what that the sun, moon and stars were made on day four? Why should that be a problem to people as they make it a problem? They say, oh, you must have an old universe, Andy. Why? You don't need an old universe. God is well able to fling the galaxies out in space as he chooses to. Grant that he has greater wisdom than you. And that he has said what he did in day four in Genesis 1. Now I'm not going to name names, but there are people that I know who are very, very erudite and have come here to this country and have been all over the world trying to say otherwise. I don't have their gifts, but I can read the scripture and I can see what the Hebrew is saying with helps of those who know the Hebrew. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. 
But when I read the scriptures and when I read these other scriptures and when I put them all together and I see the, 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 what the whole Bible is saying, which I sought to give you in just a few minutes, it is telling me that the Lord is the power which we need to acknowledge, not the universe itself. Do you see the difference? The Big Bang theorists are trying to put all the emphasis on, on, on somehow, you know, the evolution of stars, etc., etc. That's not where we should put the emphasis. We should put the emphasis on him who sustains all the universe by his power. The universe, as I've just been saying, will be folded up. Sorry, I should have put these scriptures up as I was referring to them. And that is what we should be governed by. The universe is going to be folded up and it's going to be pulled down at the end. The stars will withdraw their shining. Here's some other scriptures in Joel, which of course Matthew is probably pulling on as the Lord speaks his Olivet Discourse. When we put all these scriptures together, we see that we are dealing with a mighty, powerful God. 2 Peter 3, which draws a comparison, by the way, between the flood, which was a judgment which God caused to come upon the whole world, and the, the final folding up of the whole universe when the Lord Jesus returns. 2 Peter 3 verse 7 says, The heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. Christ, as I've constantly been saying, upholds all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1, verse 3. So when we come back to Psalm 19, what's it telling me? It's actually telling me, of course, as you all knew it, as you read the scriptures together, and that was lovely to do it that way, to have the congregation involved, not just one or ten, five people reading it at the front. The heavens declare the glory of God. May I just say one last thing before I'm forced to close and you drag me off the, <laughs> off the pulpit, Martin. <laughs> I'm sure my German friends won't do that. But, it's, but may I just, just share with you, in case you hadn't realized, that Psalm 19 has two sections. The first section is on the heavens. The second section, what was it about? You tell me. What was the second? You read it. What was the second section about? Look at verse 7. What is the second section about? It's not actually about the universe anymore, is it? It's about the law of the Lord. It's about the ways of God. It's about the scripture. What is David doing? He's saying, yes. The heavens declare the glory of God, but they are not what they were because of the fall. The law of the Lord is perfect. That's what he's doing. And he's saying, you have converted my soul. He's elevating the scripture, which is what we should do when we consider the study of the stars understand the world around you through scriptural glasses and keep yourself firmly in the word of God and you won't go wrong in understanding the world around us. When Christ died on the cross, let me close but with this. God put out the sun. We don't know how he did it because it was three hours and it clearly wasn't an eclipse because it was the 14th of the month. So, that would have meant that it was in the wrong place, the moon, even to do it. We need to come back to the cross. We need to realize that our God actually showed his control of the universe. And when, it, when actually the sun went out, do you realize that God put out the sun, but Jesus Christ is God. So he was actually controlling the sun as he put, as he put it out. And as he was on that cross, he was also controlling the breath of his persecutors. He was controlling the breath of the two thieves either side of him. He was even supporting the molecules of the iron, horrible nails that were in his hands and his feet. 
And he was even controlling all the molecules of that crown of thorns symbolizing the curse which he was taking in my place. Do you get the greatness of Christ? When we actually consider the scriptures, we are driven to Christ. And may I suggest that when it comes to the universe and any study of the science, you have a humility to say, as Luther said, grant that God knows more than you. May God be praised. And may you truly see the heavens declaring the glory of God. And may you also See that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. A bit further on it says, more to be desired are they than gold. Speaking of the precepts of God. Yea, the much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Let me ask you as I close, have you tasted the honey today? The honey of God's word. The honey of Christ speaking to you of the wonderful salvation that he procured on the cross. Have you listened to his wonderful voice spiritually through his word? And one day we will actually hear his wonderful voice which put the stars in space on day four. May God be praised. Amen.